what bad luck. He didn't have to put out this video on Monday. He decides that he wants to put out a video that's like, I've come up with my solution to abortion. Let's put it back to the states. And then 24 hours later, Arizona's like, okay, bro, zero week ban. No exceptions. Life of the mother. <laughs> Hello, everyone. This is JDL back in the seat with my best friends, Sarah Longwell and Tim Miller of The Bulwark. Guys, we're going to all get together in meat space. Do you like that word, Sarah? I bet meat, meat space? space is a word that like uh, like. Does it have moist... two E's or an E and an A? E, e and an A. Oh, Ugh. meat space. Like meat we're space. human fleshes? That's yes, gross. yes. I but we're doing it. it anyway. We're all getting together not once, but twice. Twice maybe to the head. More. Uh, yeah, maybe this, more. We're, we're, this we're, month we're in thinking Philly, about a state tour. Yep. Philly on May first. Pennsylvania, the, is the state. great my my home city, the city of brotherly love. Possibly a special appearance by Jason Kelsey. Who could say? And, uh, <laughs> I think and I can then, say probably again not. on love, May fifteenth in DC. I haven't been to Philly in ages. I've spent so much time in Philly. Really? I've gone to GW. Yeah, all everybody from everybody from G, like so. One of my good um, high, freshman year friends, Jill Priest, did this JVL because it's very similar to your situation right now. He was from Cherry Hill, New Jersey, South oh, Jersey. Yeah. But freshman year, when you're all meeting, it's like, where are you from? Da 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 da. da. He said he's from Philly. And so then uh, we become friends. A couple months later, it's it's like Thanksgiving. Or it's a break weekend. He's like, why don't we go up to my house and and. Philly. And I was like, great. We get there, and it's like, no, this is Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Like, you're not from <laughs> Philly, you're from Jersey. And so we called him Jersey. And so the rest of the time, this was, it backfired. His nickname was Jersey. So we, I me and that. Jersey went to Philly a lot together. I, I, I used to have very strong feelings about my favorite cheesesteak places, but it's so, it's been so long, I'm like out of practice. So I'm excited to Did you guys go to South Street? I bet you hung out at South, South Street a Street. lot. Hell yeah. Oh my god! I'm the so only nice. one on this pod who's actually from Pennsylvania. My grandparents lived in Philly. I grew up going to Philadelphia. Did you? Yeah, no, Did they you? lived in it. Yeah. Weren't you, you close to like Pittsburgh rural? Philly? Yeah, you were in like rural Amish country. Yeah, yeah I grew up I was, way closer to Philadelphia than you did. But my grandparents lived in Philly. Oh my god! No, they. I. Ugh. I grew up ten minutes from Center City. I grew up going to into Center City, Philadelphia, to see my grandparents for every holiday, hmm. uh, and I'm a real Eagles fan. I mean, I'm not a real Eagles fan, but I have real Eagles. I trick or treated at Randall Cunningham's house. I don't know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> Checkmate. No. Hey, you know what? Fine. I, I got gay at Sisters, the lesbian bar in Philly, Ooh. when I was working at the conservative think tank in Delaware, and I would drive up there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there. How about that? I've got that? some Delaware street well, cred, too. Okay, whatever. We're going to be in Philly. Me. If you're near Philly, if you're in Del if you're in Wilmington, if you're in Cherry Hill, if you're out in Amish country in Gettysburg, where Sarah grew up, it's out, clearly it's it's so up. close to Philly. <laughs> Not that right you now. can just come on down. Come on down. Yeah, no it's super close from Harrisburg. Yeah. Right. Not uh, working. Uh, you guys anyway, are... that's May 1st in Philly and then I've May 15th in home. D.C. It felt like Harrisburg. I don't know where it actually was, but it, <laughs> it had the vibe of Harrisburg. Uh, go to to my house. Yeah. All right, settle down, kids. Go to thebulwark.com slash events. It's so easy to remember. It's just our website, thebulwark.com slash events, because it's an event. Right. So go go there and you can get tickets. All right. Uh, big news this week is out of Arizona, which I is like desert Florida. Right. That's uh, Arizona is great. State. Actually, it's way better is than it? Florida. Arizona is cool. really it's vibey. It's pretty. It's beautiful. Or shell strip disagrees. I don't know, man. I don't I don't I don't love me some Arizona. But uh, so we got an interesting ruling from the Arizona State Supreme Court. That a law passed in 1864, which forbid all abortion after conception, except for in the life of the mother, and turned it into a felony. 1864, roughly half a century before Arizona became a state. Uh, that that law, which has existed and was not taken off the books, is still valid. And uh, so there's a little bit of confusion. Uh I am curious what you guys think about the law. I'm curious what you think about the politics. I like the dual uh, part of it. You didn't mention that. So if you're... Go ahead. You have an, yeah, no, you're an option. As, as, as of 1864, you're a do, if you're a doctor that performs an abortion, you can either do five years in prison or mm -hmm. you can do a dual with the, lo with the local sheriff from Prescott. You do 10 paces. It's a six-shooter. 
It's an interesting oh. provision. I think we should be bringing that back. We, I, I, yeah. We, You'll notice that the date on this is, is uh, quite a bit before women were given the option of voting. And so <laughs> what year was Tombstone? <laughs> what year was Tombstone? <laughs> like, I'm picturing Tombstone in my head. I don't know. I'm your Huckleberry. Really <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I, I don't know. I mean, I guess let's start with the the legal part of it. So we also have a 2022 law in Arizona, which is a 15 week ban on abortion with some exceptions. There is there is a 14 day window before enforcement would theoretically begin that has been left over by the state Supreme Court. But in practice, it's probably a 90 day window. And there is possibly some way to harmonize the 1864 law with the 2022 law. That's not going to happen. What that would be? Yeah, if, that, I don't know why they would me. harmonize it. They would just they would just the legislature would would pass the 2022 and law. They're not going to. And they're not going to. You know why? Because they've got their own little freedom caucus wing, and the Dems aren't going to want to do it because they're going to want to do this put this ballot initiative uh right. are in there for the election that puts literally puts abortion on the ballot in 2024 and so the chance for them i mean i think that there was a uh there's a tweet from somebody who i think is an absolute psychopath on twitter normally and is constantly tweeting psychopathic things but tweeted one very fun one really funny tweet which was the election the 2024 election in Arizona was called for Joe Biden on April 9th at 3:24 p.m. Fox News called it I believe it was a joke. Uh, <laughs> Fox News called uh, the election for Joe Biden. Yeah, and that is uh I think that's 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 a pretty good sense of I mean the overwhelming um conventional wisdom which I happen to agree with is that this puts Arizona, which was really going to be a struggle for Biden because of his slide with Hispanics, um, back in play in a way that now I think he's an odds-on favorite to win it. Yeah. I, just on the legal side really quick, I, and then we can, I, I'll, I'll give my punditing thoughts too if you want. But um, I, I was calling through my, my Arizona people, and they're just, they're really, I mean, they're just boned on this yeah like I, there's no way out of it i mean the only way out right is the, the attorney general has said that they won't enforce the law but then it's like okay is that going to happen in every county share random sheriffs uh you know katie hobbs could p conceivably pledge to pardon anybody that gets convicted by, of, by the local jurisdiction i think that's something that they're going to be considering um but there's not going to be a legislative fix uh, sarah mentioned the freedom caucus in arizona democrats aren't going to want their fingerprints on a 15-week ban um, or a compromise. Uh, and, and in Arizona, I don't know if you know this, the judges are on a two-year cycle where they have to get affirmed by right. the voters. And so, yeah, so they're two, appointed and then elected. Yeah, appointed and then elected. So two of the four, it was a, it's, there were seven judges in Arizona, all appointed by Republicans, uh, four, five appointed by Ducey, four of the Ducey appointees. Yeah, uh, yeah, that seems uh, totally normal in a state with a Democratic governor and two Democratic senators that, uh, you know, the entire Supreme Court is Republican appointed. Cool. Well, it's been Republican governors up until recently, so you can thank Carrie mm -hmm. Lake for that. So uh, it sounds like Katie Hobbs will get the chance to appoint two uh, because there'll be two up this year. Those guys seem to be boned. One of them include is uh, Clint Bullock, actually, somebody that I, that I know a little bit, um, who is kind of a normal, old-school, normie, traditional Republican, his 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 wife, I, and I don't I don't mean this as a pejorative about her personally because I don't know her, but her political persona is lunacy. Um, she is a she was an election denier uh, and is in the state legislature, and so uh, like he's going to be in a bad way, uh, having to own all of her political statements and having supported this. Uh, and then and then um, you know I think the legislature is pretty close in Arizona, also to flipping. Uh, so, I mean, I think that it is, it could be a nightmare. I talked to one of the Gallegos, um, I guess informal advisors, friends, um, yesterday. And he's just like, uh, he thinks that, that the Republicans might end up abandoning Kerry Lake over all this, that like, they're just going to be other better States on the map. So, we'll so see. I, I mean, a couple of questions, um, we'll talk about the Kerry Lake part of this in a second. I want to talk about the state attorney general, state attorney general, Chris Mays, you said that uh, won't be any prosecution. I don't sure love that. I Can I just say that? I didn't love that? I, I don't like that at all because, like, the law is the law. Right. And I don't love the idea of people picking and choosing, like, which laws they'll enforce and which laws they won't. Because, I mean, 
frankly, because it insulates the population from the consequences of their voting behavior. Yeah, that's and right. And if you if you say, yeah, I'm sorry, we're just, you know, we we won't. Don't worry, we won't enforce the law. Then why would there be an incentive for people to act differently? I mean, is that too hard hearted? Because there are real people here, right? There are real people who who would be affected by this, and you know, well, we I, just can't. I'm sorry, like laws have to matter. The black and white letter of the law. If you just ignore it, we do not have a system of law and order. Then, uh, and I, I obviously I'm I'm here to talk about when Republicans do that but democrats can't do it either it's just i i hate i hate it when people do this so here's the main question i have are the democrats uh this this ballot initiative that they are going to put forward how like is it too extreme i think i think there's a way you can get overconfident with the ballot initiative language uh i saw something somewhat in passing that said that it was going to be like abortion up until you know, the last minute and no restrictions whatsoever. And I think that they should be careful about overplaying their hand here. I think that they should, um, you know, have a ballot that basically just reinstates Roe. Um, what do you get? That's that's my question for you guys. I don't know. I mean, I, I worry that the consultant class answer to this is, well, you want to push for whatever gets you to 51%. Right. You want to, you know, have it be as as liberal as possible so long as you get to 51 percent, whereas like the Sarah JVL and probably Tim version of this is like you want something on the ballot that's going to get you 65 percent. Yeah, like you, you, you want you something want you, you want something you want that the gets thing a huge, that, that's right. absolute gigantic majority that makes you look like that makes you look like that shows that you are a governing party looking to create broad consensus and not just trying to get away with uh, the thing which is most barely acceptable. Yeah. Yes? And the thing that I want to have is it's not going to happen, right? Like in a healthy democracy, in an imaginary world, this 1864 law would pass and Katie Hobbs now has leverage and she goes to the legislature and she's like, okay, I don't, I didn't like the 15. Where, what can we do? You know, can we do 24 weeks and combine it with some, funding for you know mother you know pregnancy centers and for mothers that are dealing with complex pregnancies or what I, you know what other other t- paid time off I, I you know i don't know what other democratic priorities they would have that are associated right and say so let's start wheeling and dealing like but that's not happening right and you know in part because they don't have a, de- a partner to work with because the republicans yeah. in that's arizona are insane but also in part because the democrats don't seem to be in that interested at least on in this issue of of trying to find broad consensus in dealing, right? I mean, I, there's just not there. So that's just not what's going to happen. Um, and so, you know, we're staring down the barrel of putting this thing on the ballot. And, and I, yeah, I do think that initially the idea was that, that it would just reinstate Roe. I don't, know, I don't know how it ends up. But it would be nice to have something that could get to big, huge consensus. I mean, I, I mentioned this. I did a video on this for YouTube. Um, if folks want to go to the Bulwark YouTube page about the Biden ad on this, which I liked. And I, I felt like I was going to say this because I was going to be the only person to say this because Democrats weren't going to say this. But if you notice the Biden ad that they put out on abortion after Trump's statement, it featured a woman that wanted to have a baby. Yes. That was having a miscarriage. That was unable to get the um, the procedure that that she needed for her own health. It put her own health at risk. She survived. The baby obviously didn't survive because she had a miscarriage. And as a result now... It, it's going to be very challenging, if not impossible, for her to have another baby, which she wants, right? And so, yeah. to me, I, I thought that ad was very smart because yes. it appeals to the people that are pro-choice, you know, a- across the board. And it also appeals to people that are in the Liz chain, right? Like these get, you know, people that are like, that still have pro-life views that are still uncomfortable with abortion at some level, which by the way, might be Joe Biden because he never says the word abortion, um, which appeals to people that have pro-life views um, but that are upset with Republican extremism. Because if you yeah. include those people into the coalition, where it's pro-choice people, plus people that are that are generally temperamentally pro-life but aren't happy about the bounty laws, like that gets you that gets you to maybe more than sixty-five percent, probably seventy, seventy-five. Actually, yeah, if you're right. The full and so yeah. that's a good place to be for Democrats. Is, and I'm and glad that Biden did that in the app. Yeah, but it also. Here's the thing. You have to win the conversation on the other side being too extreme. And that's why I just think they should be careful 
about getting to a consensus ballot initiative that doesn't feel too extreme. Because if you give uh, Republicans the opportunity for offense, this this bill allows abortion, you know, what does Donald Trump always say, until the baby, after the baby's born, uh, which, you know, is insane and not true. But I, and, and maybe, look, some of them will say that anyway, but I, I think that having something that is very defensible to a broad swath of people is important here so that nobody shanks this opportunity because it is, I can't, tell you how much, and this is on the politics again, how much I have been the skunk at the picnic in a lot of rooms with Democrats who think that Roe is absolutely going to save them all over the board here, um, that it's a cataclysmic earthquake politically. Uh, and I think that they took the wrong lessons from 2022, um, which is that, uh, look, you are going to win in a lot of places where there are ballot initiatives and you get these high info uh voters high propensity voters who turn out for these initiatives like a big general election with a lot of issues are is just a different animal and like in 2022 abortion mattered a lot but it didn't like knock out republicans it didn't like knock out the republican in ohio it didn't knock out yeah. the republican you know it it did tip the balance in very narrow places where the candidate was extreme on abortion and also election denialism and also just in general, right? Like you got your uh, Blake Masters, oh, the Unabomber, he's fine. You got your Herschel Walker, so oh, no, look at all these women saying he paid for my abortion. You got your Tudor Dixon, like abortion mattered there where she was like, if a girl at 12 is raped, she has to carry it to term, like she gets crushed by 10 points. But it is not a silver bullet in the way that some Democrats think. And I do think it literally being on the ballot is different from sort of the abortions on the ballot, broadly speaking. Right. Um, and this is a, you know, Arizona I've been just worried about because of the slide with Hispanic voters, um, even though it has been trending bluer all the time. Like, you're right, it used to have all these Republican governors, and it now has for the first time a Democratic governor plus two Democratic senators, which are almost a direct product, both of the demographic change in the state and uh, all the people moving in, young families, how much Maricopa County has been shifting. Um, and so this just like, this is an earthquake, specifically in Arizona, and it changes the opportunity on the map. I've been sort of saying, look, you gotta really focus on these blue wall states where you got a lot more white voters, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, um, and the Nebraska too, which is another whole other issue uh, that I think we discussed a couple weeks ago. Uh, but you need that, that's your, that's your state. And now I think I would, just as a, let's say a practitioner, I would go from, worrying about how many resources I put in Arizona to like, everybody should be all in on Arizona. This is a place oh, to yeah. win. Yeah, I mean, I totally think that agree. is uh, that Biden's big opportunity. I mean, this again, helps him with the core people that it was already helping him with, right? Which is the college yeah. educated Maricopa County, Flake, right. McCain voter. His issue now is gonna be consolidating and figuring out, this is like where it's a little bit outside of my expertise about what the right issue set is, what the right message is. But if you look at the numbers that that has, going back to the Hispanic vote, Gallego is, is running out ahead of him. Yeah, you know, I mean, right. there's some Gallego Trump voters among Hispanic men and, and figuring out how to crack that. Um, but, uh, but you know, I, I think that Gallego's in really good shape now, and, and, and this looks like one of the better Biden states of the six, if, if not maybe the so second So you guys best. said the NRSC might pull the, the plug on Carrie Lake. What is she going to do on that. this? I said that. Tim said that? Yeah. I'm sorry. Is I don't, that true? Yeah. I, I, I'm not saying that I think they might pull the plug. I guess I'm just I was saying I was speaking to somebody that was at a briefing from the NRSC where they list their top five states. And then they listed their stretch states, and they mentioned Larry Hogan, and like they didn't mention Arizona. Maybe it was an oversight by the person doing the briefing. And this is just one thing, right? Like, and Yow. then they're like, "Oh right, oh right, oh right, oh right, Arizona." But I just, I think that the numbers are bad. I, the the lake is just, I, I, she's a disastrous candidate, right? And this whole yeah. like pivot back to. Get, like, why would it be better this time than it was last time? It's not like in a lot of ways she is even worse than Trump, right? Like Trump, you know, can do the whole oh I'm really a I'm really a, a you know guy that was on reality TV and remember how the great things were in 2019. Like she doesn't have any of that. Like like she has all of Trump's baggage but very little of his pluses. And so if you just kind of look at the map of of Montana and Ohio and other places, uh, you know, I just I I do think that it's possible. 
I'm not, that, I'm not saying it's definite, but it's possible if you look here at April 10th that Arizona ends up looking like not that competitive of a Senate race. Yeah. What is what is she going to do on abortion? Is she going to... Well, she came out yesterday and said she's for it, but she is so boned on this. So there is an audio. I played it on the she's Daily She's for Pod what? Today. She's for... She now says, let's go back to the 15-week. Oh, but there's, okay. from okay. her debate from the Republican gubernatorial primary, she was asked a question about this, and the audio is so clear. I guess I played on the Daily Pod that, that literally she's like, she starts by saying, I think that the... I think that they're going to uphold the 1864 territorial ban. Like she was, she was punditing. And then the interviewer follows up and says, okay, but are you for that? And she says, yes. And then that follows up and says, like, what does that mean for like birth, the birth control, the pill? And, and she's like, I'm against that. But I mean, and, and it's not like the Donald Trump mealy mouthed. Like he does that video and it's kind of like hard to get a 30 second ad cut out of it because he just, his sentences are like a stream rolling, you know, babbling down a, a mountain and like he does weird asides and stuff. He doesn't ever do subject verb predicate. She's just like, yes, yes, ban, uh, 1864 <laughs> ban, yes, awesome. ban the pill. So I, she backtracked on that yesterday. But, I mean, that ad... Good luck. Yeah, that ad's already going to be on TV. And Ruben also has more money than her, by the way. And it she has the Trump money problem, too, because um, yeah. in addition to... Uh, in addition all right, one to last thing issues. on this. Trump's, Trump has decided that this all has to go back to the states, and Pro-Life Inc. is super cool with that. They, uh, they, you know, I guess they don't care about national bans anymore after saying it was the most important thing ever. I want to hear what you think about Pro-Life Inc., JVL, but can we just, just take one moment to just wallow... I mean, Donald Trump gets so lucky sometimes. Like, like things just break Donald Trump's way sometimes. And we all have to be like, are you fucking kidding me? He got, you know, Fonnie Willis's, like, boyfriend. And what bad luck. He didn't have to put out this video on Monday. He decides that he wants to put out a video that's like, I've come up with my solution to abortion. Let's put it back to the states. And then 24 hours later, Arizona's like, okay, bro, zero week ban. No exceptions. Life of the mother. <laughs> I just want to just throw in a little bit of uh, focus group stuff on the abortion issue um, because we just did a group this week of two-time Trump voters who don't want to vote for him again, and uh, we just we asked about uh, we asked about abortion, and as there is, they were basically pro-choice uh, as a group, um, and this is, here's what one of them said. I get that they just eliminated the federal thing and that they left it up to the states. That's been so many people's argument. But you're getting to the point where you're putting women's lives at risk. And there are so many stories, like the girl out of Texas, like there's so many stories that you can see why this, this pro-life is such a terrible idea. Um, and one of the two things that Two-time Trump I, voter. Two-time Trump voter. That's right. Good. Got uh, it. But who is leaning away from Trump. <laughs> and, and here's the thing. These voters, there were a few people in the group who were going to vote for Biden. The rest of them were just like looking at RFK. You get the sense some of them would go home to Trump eventually because they really didn't like the Democrats. But they were pro-choice. And my thing about how abortion impacts elections has always had to do with whether or not abortion has high salience in that election. Um, because when it's it's not the thing, when you ask the voters at the top of the any focus group, how do you think things are going in the country? Almost nobody ever brings up abortion. Like, that's where people kind of bring up the things they're they're mad about. They're like, things are bad, and here's all the things I care about. It's usually economy, crime, inflation, uh, uh, immigration. Boat size. A lot of people Which, complain okay. that they were only able to buy a 30-foot boat and not a 34-foot boat. Sure. And that that has been an intolerable stain on their lives under Joe yeah. Biden. Yeah. Point being that uh, abortion doesn't come up organically. But when you introduce it, you get a really big response from people and people, have, they tell stories and they talk about how much, how important this is to them. And that always has made me think that you have to prosecute this case. You cannot just sit back and let it uh, just like think it's going, that people are going to come to this on your own. You have to prosecute the case actively and you have to keep it salient in people's minds. And I think that Arizona, it will not only have that salience impact now in Arizona, but that Arizona law can have salience in this entire election. Right. Like this is what happens when you leave it to states. So not just for Arizona, but for other states. So you think I, this this is OK for Trump then? You think that it works? He's like, yeah, leave it to the states. No, I think it's bad for him. You, th you think it's OK. What I'm saying is, is that this has given 
Democrats an opportunity to prosecute this case much more effectively in a forward-looking oh, way right. than in a backward-looking way, which is, well, yeah. Trump nominated these Supreme Court justices. But now it's like, look what's happening in Arizona. That can happen yeah. in your state, too. And the Texas, right? The Texas bounty stuff and the counties making it criminal t to drive through the county on the way to go out of state for an abortion. Like, this is, you know, like... I don't know. It shouldn't be that hard. You. I wanted to let you cook, though, on Pro Life Inc. It's pretty interesting. I noticed that Matt Schlapp over at CPAC was posting yesterday that American Conservative Union has always believed in the giving it back to the states and that yeah, life totally. begins at conception only in yeah. states where they decide that they want to ban that's abortion, where, not that's in other a, states. Right. right. Well, there's a quantum entanglement about life, right? Oh, and so in red states, it's very important that it begins in conception. Uh, but that doesn't count in Massachusetts. And in Massachusetts, they're fine with Massachusetts doing whatever they want. I, you know, the, the extent to which the, I sat around with Pro-Life Inc. for a long, long time and watched any, any Republican deviating like a half tick from the line get thrown up against the wall and, and beat up. Watch them drive basically pro-life democrats out of the party i mean the democratic voters did this too but there were still a handful of pro-life dems left and you know like the susan b anthony list would come out and campaign against them because they weren't like sufficiently pro-life ain't none of that gonna happen now right this is something i i would like to see them in their principles today with donald trump but you know who does get to too. still just say the right thing just say what he believes on abortion though mike pence your friend mike pence yeah that's Isn't right. You saw Mike Pence did the right thing. Is it, well, you know, or at least <laughs> at least he did the thing that was true to his to himself. Yes. We got a big storm happening here in Norland. Sorry about the background thunder there, but that thunder might be Mike might be Mike God's wrath on uh, the non Mike Pence uh, pro lifers. But I, I, shouldn't the Mike Pence story, JVL, be like a message to everybody about how wonderful it is when you free yourself from the shackles of Trump? And if Mike Pence hadn't freed himself, he wouldn't be able to do it. He'd be the one out here doing the, well, you know, two-step, the abortion two-step, the states' rights two-step. He doesn't have to do that anymore. Isn't that a— It should be, but, I, you know, I think that it's, it's a cautionary tale. Like, look at—geez, Mike's over there saying this stuff, and nobody cares anymore, even. He can't, we can't make sure, got to make sure I don't become Mike Pence. That would be the worst thing in the world, right? This is, this is what I think— complimented in the triad. Yeah, right. The worst thing that can happen to you. All right. Uh, brief no labels stuff. Uh, last week, no labels. This was, you guys did the secret show about this, right? Not the, uh, not TNL mm -hmm. about this. Um, we had a I'm great secret a show. Bit. Man, the feedback on the secret, secret show was great. Yeah, you might be getting great. the boot. Who knows? Who, who um, knows? We'll omitted was the fact that, uh, I mentioned this in the green room. Sarah, you didn't say when you and Tim were taping the secret. Who was it who turned you on to Caitlin Clark a year and a half ago? It was you. It oh. was you. Oh, it was right. you. Yeah. So, Miss, like, I champion women's sports. I believe I'm the only person here who has coached women's sports and who was there with the Caitlin Clark. Did either of you guys watch the championship game on the ESPN feed where they put, like, Rebecca Lobo and somebody else, like, just sitting around over talking? I a little bit, yeah. That feed is genius. Yeah, really That's good. the best way to watch to watch uh, championship games. There should be a version of that for the men's game. Okay. Uh, no labels. I just wanted to say good on them. I apologize to no labels. I take back all the mean things I said about them because at the end of the day, they did the right thing, and I didn't think they would. And so their hearts were clearly in the right place the whole time. I was ascribing... Motives to them that I guess were incorrect. Good for them. I hope they go to Spago every day and enjoy the heck out of it. You should Thank send you. them a gift certificate. You should send Nancy Jacobson a Spago oh, yes, gift certificate. Yes, you should. I don't think Spago does gift cards. You don't? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's the... They, uh, they don't do coupons Puck. or gift cards at Spago. Okay. I don't believe. Can but, I just... I, I, yeah? I, think, I think magnanimous... JVL is wonderful, JVL. However, their reason for dropping their bid was just because no one would do it. Incorrect. No Spago Did does they... have a gift card. $50. Oh we are going to send that to Mark Penn and Nancy Jacobson. Maybe not Mark Penn. 
I just Nancy. Nancy, Nancy go alone. Nancy can $150 go alone. One fifty dollars for for her alone. Yeah. Uh, no, I like. I mean, they're not saying There's nothing that, that... ruder than sending somebody a fifty dollar gift certificate <laughs> to a fancy restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> ding ding ding. <laughs> Go have an appetizer. <laughs> um, yeah, I. Uh, this is a real question, though. When they pulled the plug, did they say that it was because they didn't want to elect Donald Trump? Or did they say because the dastardly forces of a criminal conspiracy prevented us from being able to find somebody? Like, which. And so I'm willing to just give them the benefit of the doubt and say that. I think they, they said they the latter, the, actually. Oh, did they? No. I think so, but. Then fork you know, those whatever. Guys. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I really, I'm grateful to them for, to, look, they did the right thing. Totally. Whatever their motives, they did the right thing, and I'm grateful for it. And I'm going to send Nancy big five zero for her to blow at Spago. Okay, uh, Ron Klain has a piece out. In, now, I guess he doesn't have a piece. It's a, a piece reporting about Ron Klain and Politico Good. complaining that Joe Biden is talking too much about his effing bridges and trains. And I think this is fantastic. It's, uh, it's, it's so perfect. Here, here's the audio. I think the president is out there too much talking about bridges. He does two or three events a week where he's cutting a ribbon on a bridge. And here's a bridge. <laughs> All I could think of was Oprah. And you get a bridge. And you get a bridge. <laughs> Back to Ron Klain. Like, I tell you, if you go into the grocery store, you go to the grocery store, and you know eggs and milk are expensive. And the fact that there's a fucking bridge is not blah, 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 blah. Um, I. One of the blah, 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 blahs, which I just want to read. Like it's a bridge. How interesting is the bridge? It's a little interesting, I guess, but not a lot interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what you guys think about this. I think the, I think the bridges are important. I think they're, they're good. Uh, I, I got to say, I think it's a strange time to discount the importance of bridges. I just feel like uh, for the timing in this particular moment, I'm not sure we've talked as much about the importance of a bridge or as we have in the last three. I, I think, look, I, I like it because I think Ron Klain is correct on the merits of talking about the prices of things and, and whatnot. And, but I also, uh, I do think that the infrastructure stuff is important. And I think that we've, we've been asking for Joe Biden to go cut ribbons. Uh, yeah, I feel he's doing like, it. I also feel like these are just not either or propositions. Yeah. Uh, these are the kinds of things of like, here's a bridge and we're working on prices. Like, I, I don't know. Tell them you're doing a lot. But I don't know. Tim, what do you yeah, think? I, I mean, some of this, it's a leaked audio. You're talking extemporaneously. You know, he thinks yeah. he's among friends. Yeah, you know, it's, you're trying. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't want to like meet out, you know, every sentence and every clause here of what he said. I, I think the broader point, which is an, a different quote than you read, which is he's not running for Congress. He's running yeah. for president. And you got and to as the George H. W. Bush saying, you gotta have the vision thing. I think that's fair. And I and I think that Ron Klein during the midterms, they needed to have Ron Klein. I was happy that Ron Klein was in there because there was a group that was around Biden, reportedly, that was like, he's got to focus on democracy. That's why he did the big democracy speech with the red light that the right figured out. Then Klain, again, reportedly, I'm not in the White House, but this is what, every, what people say. It was, you know, monomaniacal about we got to get gas prices down. We got to open up, you know, the strategic reserve. And as it turns out, it was like they needed to do both those things, right, to yeah, your both right. end, right? And so it's nice yeah. to have somebody around in the inner circle that's saying, hey, OK, it's just it's not enough to just do the, you know, rest on our record, rest on our laurels. And and to me, the infrastructure thing has always been less about the most potent infrastructure message is less about, hey, you got this bridge than like, hey, Joe Biden can do things and Donald Trump can't. Joe Biden cares about you and Donald Trump cares about himself. And that's why I'm always happiest when Joe Biden's cutting ribbons in red states and red districts not because he's going to necessarily win these people over because it's a message to the gettable people that's like i care about you i'm here you know i'm not i'm not one of those you know college campus kids that the nikki haley donor is worried about um you know i'm not one of them i'm not i'm scranton joe right and so to me that kind of element of it is a stronger contrast than than you know you can get bogged down in the uh uh, just listing out the accomplishments. Element. So, Tim, you said something that I would like to to excavate a little bit. You said okay. it's not enough for Biden to rest on his laurels. 
right? It's not enough to say, look at all these yeah. good things I just did. And that's true. That is a real thing that voters, voters show time and time again. With one tiny exception. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Donald Trump's entire campaign is his laurels, and his laurels consist only of the first 36 months of his presidency. The also, final 12 months did not happen. Also, and he's the only guy in American Biden's history laurels. who can do this. Nobody knows about Joe Biden's laurels. Like, you're living the fact it right now I, but, but on they their boats. They don't know about it. They don't give him credit for it. And yeah. so I do think it's important for him to talk about. I'm in no. favor. I'm just saying, well, why is it that voters I, are I willing actually, to be see, like, yeah, is, Trump's laurels are great. This I'll is the that. version of you and JVL's long-running it's, optimism it's, pep pessimism yeah. debate. This is me and JVL's long-running debate. Donald Trump is being punished for that. I, honestly, like, if Donald Trump would stop talking about 2020 election fraud, and, and if Donald Trump would take Ron Klain's advice and go out into uh, industrial Amer the industrial Midwest and have rallies every day where he's talking about how he's going to get prices down and how that damn car insurance is going up at 22%, the latest inflation thing, and I, I, his numbers would probably be better. I think. I, I do think that Donald Trump has been hard. Donald Trump lost in 2020. They lost in 2022. They lost in 2018. I, I think that that he would, that, that Donald Trump should also, well, he shouldn't because we want him to lose, but Donald Trump could also benefit from listening to Ron Klain. I don't think he's going to. Not losing enough. <laughs> True. Concur. Okay. Uh, final thing, Gaza. Tim, you wanted to do a quick Gaza darkness. Listen, if you're listening and you don't want to listen to Gaza darkness, I hear you. Fast forward seven minutes because Sarah has a present for you that she's going to give us as a reward for the people who sit through this Gaza stuff. And then I have a bonus second present that I'm going to give to people as Ooh. well. Um, okay. Uh, so your newsletter yesterday on Gaza. Why don't you describe your newsletter? And then we can, and then I, I can explain my, why yeah, I'm even I haven't, darker. I haven't had a chance to get to it yet. So yeah. okay. like 4,000 words. I don't know Sarah looked at it and she, and she was like, 4,000 words on Gaza. Pass. Okay. <laughs> pass. All right. There's a Real Housewives. There's a lesbian Real Housewives episode on I can get to instead. Literally a thing I've never watched, but please go. <laughs> uh, I, I don't even know how to sum it up. Tim, so I will you, sum it up you for you this it, way. Tim. Your, you point, your point is that in any, in any war, I, I, the stability comes with equilibrium. Okay? Stability comes with equilibrium. Your point was that well, the fundamental problem here is that Hamas... To Hamas, equilibrium is elimination of the Jewish state. That's equilibrium from Hamas. They will not get to equilibrium as long as the Jewish state exists. So that's a problem. Then your, your second point, which is the one that I disagree with, because I agree with you totally on Hamas being genocidal and awful and, and wanting Israel to not exist. Your second point was, so Israel's view of equilibrium is that Hamas is eliminated, and then there's a two-state solution where you bring in Arab countries like Saudi Arabia and you normalize relationships between them and Israel and you all fund a re rebuilding of Gaza. Right? That was your, yes. that, that's your take. Yes. And that, and to, be, to be clear, that, I view that, that pathway as a pathway of decades, not a like thing that happens in 24 months. Um, okay. Which takes me to where I'm at. So you view that as a pathway of decades. And may, so maybe that is the right answer. You eliminate Hamas and then you get over the course of decades to some kind of equilibrium. But here's my thing. I, just, I, don't, I don't think that that equilibrium is possible. I just don't think that it exists. Like, and, and I think that if you accept reality, like the theory of the case is if you, if you listen to actual, it, like the, the people that are in charge of Israel, and if you listen to them, I don't think they really think that's the case either. And I think that there's some people in the Israeli government that say, that think it's the case, but I think that to Israel, like equilibrium is like military occupation of Gaza now, semi permanently. Who knows? You, so you say decades, maybe forever, and so maybe that's it. Okay, and, and so my, but I, I don't think that's very possible to have a very successful outcome either. And so to me, I look at what's happening in Gaza, and I just think that like it's really darker than what you say. Like neither of those equilibriums are possible. Um, the idea that, that Israel is going to eliminate Hamas, which doesn't seem like they're going to do anymore, or maybe they're going to change their plans, I don't know, but they're like removing the IDF now from Gaza, but that Israel is going to eliminate Hamas, kill tens of thousands more people, 
that Gaza is going to be complete. Uh, it's already 80% basically rubble, but Gaza is going to be completely rubble. And then the family and friends of the people that have been killed are going to come back to Gaza and start a new government that peacefully coexists with Israel in partnership with Saudi Arabia. I, I just like, I don't think that's going to happen. Like to me, that's a fanciful future that is not possible. And so I, I'm with every whenever people are like, "Oh, Tim, you've gone lib. Like we need to eliminate Hamas. Great, let's eliminate Hamas." But I just think as a practical matter, if you look at the the choices, maybe the real equilibrium, which is horrible, by the way, because I just don't think that the, I'm in a dark place. I don't think there's any good options. Is that Israel backs off, tries to re um, reestablish some pretty frayed relationships with allies, gets aid in there, you know, were, uh, uh, presents a some kind of solution to Saudi Arabia and to its Western allies that this is a country that's going to try to, that they're going to do their best, blah, 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 and, and does deal with what you say in the, the newsletter is unacceptable with the fact that 200 whatever, like, like that right across the border from them, there are going to be people there that want to eliminate them and kill them. And that the Israel government is going to have to be more vigilant than they clearly were in the final years under Netanyahu when they were warned that this was going to happen and weren't prepared for it. I'm not saying this is a good solution. That I'm like, oh, yay, I'm happy that Israel is going to have to have genocidal terrorists like right next to them on their border. But to me, if, if the real, if the like, if the reality is that they're probably going to end up with terrorists that want them killed and eliminated on their border no matter what happens, then maybe once you work from that set of facts, then your strategic imperatives become different because you're just accepting the horrible reality that they're living in. So that's my that's my dark place on uh, what's happening there and why I just I, – I, every time I read your, your – I've read several people's pitch for what happens when you eliminate Hamas. And I was like, if anybody's going to write a pitch that's going to resonate with me, it's going to be that commie JVL. And I read your pitch, and it still felt kind of like I fanciful. Like I just don't think it's going to happen. Well, it's, it's not going to happen now. It's not going to happen with the Netanyahu government. Um, this is, but the, I mean, I think a two-state solution is the inevitable endpoint of this, right? I mean, Arafat I walked away from this at Camp David in two thousand and. Maybe it doesn't happen in 2026, but by, you know, maybe it doesn't happen in 2040. But at some point, does there, anybody like, want know, a two-state solution besides American Democrats and Europeans? Uh, like, does anyone in the Middle there, East want a two-state solution still? There was broad support for that in Israel 25 years ago, uh, and there could be again. It doesn't and, seem like there is now. No, not right now. Certainly not among the political class. But that, again, just the logic of this, I think, leads there. Ultimately, there's just a lot of shit you got to wade through to get there. Uh, Sarah, I am. I can tell that you are dying to tell what you think about all this. So please go ahead. Please don't make me talk about this okay. right now. You don't have to. Uh, you had something nice for the people. Okay, the, no, I, it's a, a reader requested my rebuttal to JVL, and I just want to say that the reader totally agreed with JVL. And he wanted to hear JVL own me. And it didn't seem like that happened. So I'm sorry that you might not be satisfied, but maybe in a different or do you feel like I was owned, JVL? I I don't I, I I think you and I basically agree. I'm sorry. I think you're saying like I can't see any of this happening in the near future. And I'm saying none of this is going to happen in the near future. But the logic of this stuff all sort of leads in the same way that you could say like uh, India was always going to become independent of the British colonial system because it is impossible for a tiny island nation halfway across the world to rule a country with 400 million people, right? Uh, now, India did not become independent for like 100 years, but all through that you could see that the logic of it eventually is that India becomes a sovereign state. Yeah. Right? This is, I hear you. I'm just not sure the logic would exist. I guess my analogy was more towards Iraq, which was like, if you look, if you said at the beginning of the Iraq conflict, there is no chance that there will be a Germany in the Middle East and that we'll have the same success, then that would have informed the strategic imperatives quite a bit, right? And so it would have informed the choices that you make, right? And so if you're living in a world where like really like a peaceful Arab Israel coexistence is not as extremely unlikely. Yeah, no, I'm unlikely. Then maybe but, that changes your possible your strategy. Ultimately. And 
I, I will say this one one thing uh, a number of people said you know no don't you understand whenever you kill a terrorist like you know you only create five more and that is sometimes true that is sometimes not true when we eliminated isis it was not the case that like it created five new terrorists for every ISIS. What created a bunch of new ISIS members was ISIS running around unchecked in Syria, right? ISIS succeeding created a whole bunch of new ISIS recruits. Yeah, that's a uh, fair point. And so it's, you know, like sometimes if you if you kill all the terrorists, you do a good job at it and you're competent at it, um, then you kill all the terrorists. Um, yeah. Anyway, all this is terrible and there are no good things and a lot of innocent people are dying and everybody's unhappy. Sarah, and eight is tell getting us something in now, funny. which is good. Eight is getting in now, which yeah. is good. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to turn the page on this conversation to a very <laughs> hard pivot. Hard, hard pivot. pivot. Everybody okay? And Actually, as a, dessert. As a, as a palate cleanser, I'm just going to say that the Trump was just asked about what he thinks, whether he thinks the Arizona Supreme Court went too far in their abortion ruling, and he says, "Yeah, they did, and that'll be straightened out." And as you know, it's all about states' rights. Clear as mud, sir. Yeah. Uh, That's so right. when they say it's going to be straightened out, do you think Trump could go in there to the Freedom caucus legislators in the state and be like, you're about to cost me Arizona, knock yeah. it off? No chance? You can't do it? No. Abortion is the too. one issue he can't do it on, I don't think. These guys are not going to get cucked by Katie Hobbs. But he's right. It will all be straightened out. See? Like, whatever. At some point, there will be a decision, and whatever the decision is, it will be. And so it will all have been straightened out according to the, the, the rights of the future will take care of itself. That's, yeah. That's the genius of being running for president when you have no interest in governing. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I just have a story to tell JVL, uh, but I'll tell you both. Uh, it just happened last night, and I was at an event, uh, and I happened to be at this event with one Pete Buttigieg. Now, mm. I will tell you that I have a few things that I do sort of when I have to go to these like events with, you know, fancier people. Number one, they often have dress codes. I always wear jeans, no matter what the dress code is. Power I refuse. Move. I, I refuse. It. So I'm always just a little bit of already yeah. like a What about the gloves? Do you wear the gloves too? I don't, I don't wear the fingerless, fingerless gloves. That was right? never a thing. Okay. It's a thing that you've made up since you were wearing fake glasses. Do you pop the collar when you're uh, at these I things? wear the pop collar if I'm wearing something with a collar that pops. Good. But okay. uh, anyway, so but so last night I'm like, and I see Pete, and I'm like, I would like somebody please to introduce me to Pete. Oh, no, my point is, is that like I can, I can hang normally, right? Like I can hang. I'll be in my jeans. Nobody can touch me. There's a few people. There's like a handful of people that I feel that I get nervous around or that I'm like, I have the, the I have the, I might fan girl. You got nervous them. around Secretary and, Pete? Well, so Liz Cheney's one of these people uh, where I sort of lose the ability to speak cogently um, and, and act cool. Um, but Pete, who I've always really liked, uh, turns out to be another one, apparently. Because here's what mm -hmm. happened. I uh, had somebody, another person who I knew who was, I, I said, well, you got to introduce me to Pete. And so she does. She walks me up to Pete, and she's like, you got to meet Sarah. Sarah's great. Here's some things about her. And, uh, and I was like, be cool, be cool. And I was like, hey, how great to meet you. Uh, and, and he acts like he acts like he knows who I am. And I immediately am like, you don't know who I am. It's OK. Uh, it just don't, it's cool. And I was like, hey, how are your kids doing? And he was like, they're great. And he says some things about his kids. And then I, he's like, do you have kids? Yeah, they're five and seven. And I said, did you say, I just, oh, I thought you knew me, Pete. No, I didn't. I didn't. I, I said uh, I said they're five and seven. I was like, you know, I remember my 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 oldest was born, um, and I remember holding him in the hospital during the American Carnage speech, and just thinking to myself, uh, you know, I'm not going to let him grow up in this world, right? And I'm like, nailed that, nailed that. And then he says, he says, oh, your kid's birthdays are January twentieth, or your kid's birthday is January twentieth, and I was like, no. And he was like, okay. And I was like, my kid's birthday is in June. And then I was like, nope, it's in July. And I was like, it's July 15th. Nope, it's July 20th. Uh, and for some reason, I can't remember my kid's birthday. And he just goes, oh, because, you know, the January 20th is when Trump gave the American Carnage speech. And so my kids were born on January 20th. Uh, and so we would have shared, our kids would have shared a birthday. And I was like, 
I was like, it was the RNC convention. It was the RNC convention is what I mean, right? Not the American Carnage speech. So already I'm like whiffing this hard, right? It was the I alone can fix it speech. <laughs> so so, I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm stammering through this. Can't remember my kid's birthday. And I can feel the sweat and the redness starting to creep up. And so I'm looking for something else to do. And I see a, a friend, a mutual friend of Tim and mine is <laughs> in the corner. And for some reason, I just said, I point. I, like, do an aggressive point at the thing. And Pete kind of looks at what I'm pointing at and is just looking at me. And I'm like, I, I said, I see a guy. I see a guy. And this, I'm just like, I'm pointing. And I see a guy. And he's going, okay. So this thing's going off the rails, me and Pete talking. Is there a uh, video of this anywhere? <laughs> no. So I'm, I'm sitting there being like, Longwell, pull it together. Uh, at which point I decide, forget it, just going to have to fangirl because I've, I've lost it all with the rest of it. And I'm like, um, you know, I, you were the one I wanted in the, in the primary. Uh, and he was like, oh, okay, that's very nice of you. I was like, because, you know, you have all the best words. <laughs> and he was like, okay. And I don't know why I felt thought that like he would get the joke of you have all the that's best a, that's words. That's a bulwark that joke. You- that's a bulwark joke, not a real world joke. And then someone else started to walk up towards him, and I just turned around and walked away because I had, I'd lost. It was over. It was over. There was no more need. Uh, but yeah, you have all the best words. I just said the thing you say about him. That's so impressive. Amazing. I so love impressive. it. That's great. So uh, I guess night, he's going to been... be super happy to be a guest on the Bulwark podcast. You, uh... I don't know. I, I can never see him again, so you can't tell him I'm here. I can never look at him again. How much, when you were in bed at night, last night, like how much of this was just kind of rolling in your head? It was really the part where I pointed aggressively and just said, there's a guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tim. I had one more you. topic that I wanted to bring up. Did you mention to Pete um, anything about the duel? The duel, the Arizona, the Arizona duel law? <laughs> Because I do have to share that about 40 minutes ago in this podcast, you might notice an awkward jump, and it's because Sarah and JBL both thought I was serious when I was saying that the, that the Arizona law called for a duel. And at 10 paces between the abortion doctor and the local sheriff, that's not actually the case. So if any of you also thought that was not a joke, I was wondering why the joke wasn't landing with people. I was like, I think that's pretty funny. You no, know, it's like dead serious from both of you. But maybe too that's just a sign real. that I deadpanned it too good. Um, yeah. I mean, it's like so. saying, like, hey, there's this law about subsidizing mohair that says <laughs> that uh, if a farm has a gross to, a gross uh, product of under 500,000 tons of hair, then it qualifies for a subsidy. Like, but of course, it's only 200 tons. Like, that's – it's too close to real life to, too close. to be the mohair. recognizable okay. as a joke. Well, okay. All right. uh, listen – Philly and D.C., May 1st in Philadelphia, May 15th in Washington, D.C. Go to thebulwark.com slash events. Get a ticket. Come hang out with us. And Sarah will, while she's talking to you, point at some other rando and say, there's a guy. It'll be great. Bye. Bye.